Hi, everybody. I wanted to talk about moods. Because it's sometimes felt that uh, consciousness is a bit paradoxical in that it is uniquely resistant to understanding through scientific explanation. But uh, uh, at the same time, it seems like the phenomenon closest to us in some sense. Uh, it's almost, it, it is us. And uh, Roy Wood Sellers, a philosopher, said uh, almost 100 years ago that only with consciousness are we on the inside of nature. And that feels exactly right. Uh, and yet it's resistant to uh, a scientific explanation in a particular, in a, in, a, in a specially robust way. But I think of all conscious phenomena, this is particularly true of mood. So uh, mood is definitely part of our conscious experience. So right now I have a conscious experience of seeing you guys, of hearing various sounds, of thinking about how to make my next point, etc. And all these experiences feel one way if I'm in a good mood and they feel a different way if I'm in a bad mood. So the mood is definitely part of the conscious experience. But at the same time, it's, it feels very different from these other experiences. There's a way to think of our conscious life as a kind of a parade of more or less punctate experiences, or the visual, auditory, cognitive, etc. But mood is not part of the parade. Mood doesn't, the moods are not paraded along with the other experiences. Mood is almost like the air in which the parade is taking place. It's the, it's the atmosphere that the, that, that the punctate experiences uh, breathe and live in. And so it's, it's in a way, the, the, it's, it's the stuff of consciousness, so it's really closest to us. But at the same time, it's, it's also especially difficult to fit into scientific explanation because it doesn't fit well into the main kind of governing paradigm we have for understanding the mind, which is this idea of the mind as a representational engine. Uh, Nick Humphrey talked about this earlier. The, why would uh, the mind evolve? Uh, essentially because an organism that can represent its environment is better placed to succeed in uh, survival and reproduction than a, an organism that cannot represent or can represent uh, more poorly its environment. And so um, we, we often succeed in cognitive science when we fit different mental phenomena into this representational paradigm. But with mood, it's, it's hardest to see. If I, so for example, this morning I woke up in an irritable mood as I often do. And uh, when I think about what it was about, it was about nothing. It's in the sense in which my son is the object of my affection, nothing was the object of my irritability or my irritable mood. Um, yeah, my affection bends towards my son. My, my irritable mood wasn't bending towards anything. It was just suffusing my experience in general. So it's hard to see how moods fit into uh, this representational paradigm. For this reason, we have been given uh, wood here. Uh, for this reason, I wanted to talk about mood. And I want to do three things in the little time that was uh, left for me. Uh, one is to talk a little bit more about the experience, the, uh, the, the phenomenon itself, the experience of mood. Uh, and why we should care about it, then talk very quickly about the kind of the main approach to within the representational uh, framework for understanding mood, which I think Bill Seeger was uh, important in uh, you know, pioneering. And uh, then I want to offer a, uh, an alternative that I think is, uh, is the truth. So, uh, uh, mood comes in many shades, our language for mood is pretty coarse-grained. Here are some of the terms we use, depression, anxiety, serenity, cheerful, cheerfulness, irritability, boredom, calmness, gloominess, melancholy, euphoria. Um, as with other affective phenomena, they tend to divide into uh, positive moods and negative moods. 
And uh, like I said, th these are very coarse grained terms. To really get the, 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 the lived feeling of a mood, the, the texture of, uh, of mood, uh, we need poets for that. But uh, uh, we're not all poets, so we have these terms. And uh, one problem with this terminology is that all of these terms seem to be systematically ambiguous. Uh, in one, you take a term like uh, depression, in one sense, it can be used to refer to an experiential phenomenon, the, the felt mood that, uh, that I was talking about, which can take anywhere between uh, an hour and a whole day. But the, we also use the term depression, clinical psychologists in particular talk about depression, they have in mind something more of a stable condition, a standing condition that, uh, that uh, persists be, uh, anywhere between a few days or maybe a week or a couple of weeks to, to many years. And uh, if, I, if I was in charge of society, I would introduce the stipulation that we should use the locution, I feel depressed to talk about the, the mood experience and the, we would use the locution, I am depressed, to talk about the stable condition that the clinical psychologists are interested in. But uh, I'm not in charge of society, so I'm just going to stipulate that the, I, I'm, by mood consciousness or mood experience, I have in mind the experiential phenomenon. And by mood condition, I'm talking about the, the, the most stable condition. Now, my interest here is in mood consciousness because consciousness this is, is the topic of the conference, but also because I think mood consciousness is the more fundamental concept here, that mood conditions are defined in terms of mood consciousness. So, for example, what it means to be depressed or to, be, to have the depression as a mood condition, I think it just means that the person, uh, over a period of time, experiences a preponderance of depression as the mood experience or mood consciousness. And uh, uh, anxiety as, as the kind of the stable condition is just a matter of a preponderance of anxiety feelings, anxiety moods in the experiential sense of mood. You may want to introduce also a, a, uh, another condition to do with a disposition, a, a stable disposition, but I think just a disposition will not be enough because someone who has a disposition to feel anxious but just hasn't, uh, I, we wouldn't say that they have been in an anxious, uh, they've, they, they, uh, they, they've been in, in an anxious condition. Uh, and likewise for depression. So you, there really needs to be a preponderance of mood experiences. Now, it would be very useful, I think, to have a term for the preponderance of negative mood experiences of any kind. So depression, anxiety, irritability, gloominess, and also for a preponderance of good moods, so cheerfulness, levity, serenity, euphoria, etc. I actually think we do have words for that. Uh, the name of the preponderance of positive mood experiences is happiness, felicita. And the uh, name of the uh, uh, stable condition in which you experience a lot of negative moods is unhappiness. So if I tell you something true, which is the last time I, I was really happy in my life was between mid-November of last year to mid-January of this year. This was a, a happy period in my life. What am I reporting when I'm telling you this? What am I, what am I communicating to you? I think I'm communicating that there was, I was in a good mood a lot of the time. There was a preponderance of good moods. I was happy. So, I think mood consciousness is not just the stuff of consciousness, but it's also the stuff of happiness. So, uh, if you care about happiness, uh, you should care about mood consciousness as a phenomenon to understand. Now, like I said, uh, it's not really clear how to fit mood into this picture of the mind as a representational engine that kind of crunches representations and produces, forms representations and transforms representations. Uh, this kind of representational engine, it's, uh, you know, why would you need to have moods in order to, to represent the world? Uh, couldn't you represent the world without moods? So there is an approach, you know, a representational approach to moods, which is based on the observation that 
even though moods feel diffuse and undirected, they are still responsive to the world. So there was a reason why I was happy from mid-November mid to mid-January. I won't get into it, but there was something that actually happened that, uh, that, made me, uh, that made me happy. And in general, moods are responsive to the way uh, the world is. And so some people have suggested that maybe that's what's special about mood. It represents, uh, it represents uh, the world, but it represents the world as a whole in an undifferentiated sort of way. So for example, depression represents the world as a whole is awful or meaningless. Here awful, meaningless are, are again, very coarse-grained terms. Um, to, to get to the, to the texture of depression, you need something a bit more, uh, you need a poet. Uh, so uh, one poet you may have heard of is uh, Shakespeare and uh, his Hamlet, one of the greatest um, uh, uh, melancholic protagonists, says this, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. So the world is, uh, it has this kind of weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. This is better than awful and, uh, and meaningless. Uh, later on, he says, uh, it goes so heavily with my disposition, my melancholic disposition, that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with a golden fire. A majestical roof is the sky and a golden fire is, uh, is the sun. Rombodoro is what uh, Marinetti called it. Why, it appears to, uh, no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors, so something insubstantial and devoid of value. And that's how a poet captures the feeling of, uh, but look, he still talks about the earth and the air, kind of the, kind of the, the world in its uh, globality. And what's interesting here is that uh, intellectually, Hamlet can understand that the earth is a goodly frame and that the air is an excellent canopy and a majestical roof. Uh, but that's just intellectually. And in terms of his experience, he experiences the world as this foul and pestilent congregation of vapors a kind of a worthless thing, thing devoid of any value. So uh, likewise, uh, you might say that uh, anxiety represents the world as a, a, a place full of menace, that euphoria represents the world as, as wonderful. as a beautiful uh, poem by Fernando Pessoa that uh, captures this nicely, but I don't have time for this. Uh, so, uh, this is kind of an approach to capture the, the, the function of mood within a representational framework. Mood represents the world as a whole. Now, there's a couple of problems. I have a couple of problems with this. First of all, it's not clear why mood would be diffuse and undirected if it represented the world. Uh, the world is a big thing, but it's still just a specific one object. Uh, I can look at the sun, the sun is big, but the, uh, my experience of the sun is not diffuse and under, does not feel diffuse and undirected. And uh, more importantly, I think that feeling depressed is not the same as believing that the world is awful. A feeling euphoric is not the same as believing that the world is wonderful. So all of these things, uh, these beliefs also represent the world as wonderful or as, uh, as awful, etc. And yet, they are not, they don't have that quality of mood. So something is missing here. There needs to be something more than a representation of the world. Now, there's an, a kind of a variant on this that says, forget about the world, focus on everything. So depression represents everything is awful and meaningless. So this is slightly different for philosophers of language, they would say. Uh, here, the, the proposition communicated uh, or conveyed uh, is, is, uh, is not a singular proposition about the world, but a universally quantified proposition about uh, everything. All X is such that X is uh, awful. And uh, the same thing you could do with anxiety and euphoria, but I think this doesn't really help. It Maybe it can say, oh, if it's about everything, then it's, it's more diffuse between all different objects. But yeah, on the flip side, it's not actually true that everything seems wonderful when you're euphoric. If, uh, 
if you step in dog shit, for example, when while euphoric, maybe you'll brush it off more easily, but it's not like you're experiencing it as this wonderful thing. Um, and uh, also feeling depressed is not the same as believing that everything is awful, et cetera, et cetera. So we haven't really made any progress on the second point. All right, what should we do? I have a proposal that starts with this more standard idea and offers two modifications. So I'll tell you what the modifications are, uh, first in a kind of a slightly cryptic way and then I'll explain them. So the first modification is to switch from the universal proposition, everything is wonderful, to what is called the generic, things are wonderful. And the second is to switch, to relocate the wonderfulness from the content of the mood experience to the attitude. So here, the, the two contrasts that are important are between universal and generic and between content and attitude. So what do I mean there? Uh, linguists and philosophers of language have been very interested in generics of the form dogs have four legs. So linguistically, generics are, uh, are defined as uh, statements that, or sentences that have what are called bare plurals. So dogs here is a plural noun, but it's bare in the sense that it's not preceded by any quantifier. So it's not some dogs, it's not all dogs have four legs, it's not seven dogs have four legs. There's no quantifier at all, there's just dogs. Dogs have four legs. And we know this is true, we teach this to our kids. And uh, at the same time, we've all seen three-legged dogs. And the three-legged dogs falsify the universal statement, all dogs have four legs, but they don't seem to falsify the generic statement, dogs have four legs. And that kind of raises a very interesting question for linguists, what information exactly in conveyed is conveyed by the generic, dogs have four legs. Now this is a generic about dogs, so it's pretty generic, but what is the most generic generic? The most generic generic you would have is about things. So instead of everything is wonderful, um, uh, Euphoria might uh, talk about things are wonderful, things in general. And this is supposed to help, I think, with the problem of the diffuse feel of mood because uh, even when the, uh, a representation is about everything, it's, it applies determinately to every thing, single thing. When it's about things in general, it doesn't determinately apply to any particular thing. It does not, yeah, I just said that. All right, I don't think that by itself helps this point of switching from universals to generics, helps with the question of what separates uh, uh, moods from certain beliefs because you could also believe that things are awful or that things are wonderful and that's not the same as having the mood. So for this I think we need the distinction between content and attitude which I'll introduce very quickly. So here's a mental state you might have, believing that the weather will be nice tomorrow. And here's a question, which of the following two mental states does this, does this one resemble more? The hope that the weather will be nice tomorrow or the belief that the weather will be bad tomorrow? I think the correct answer is, in one respect, the belief that the weather will be nice tomorrow resembles more the hope that the weather will be nice tomorrow, because they're both about the weather being nice tomorrow. But in another sense, the belief that the weather will be nice tomorrow resembles more, in another respect, it resembles more the belief that the weather will be bad, because they're both beliefs. So there seem to be two aspects or dimensions to the belief that the weather will be nice tomorrow and it can resembles or not resembles other mental states independently along these two dimensions. Um, content is what we call the uh, pinkish dimension here and attitude is what we call the verdigree dimension. So uh, you could in some sense say that content is what the belief is about and attitude is how, how the belief represents this, uh, this content that it's about. Um, it is a particular notion of how um, I think there's this belief, when you believe that the weather will be nice tomorrow, what the belief does is that it, it frames the weather is, will be nice tomorrow as it's really like that, it's really true. So belief, what, does, what belief does is that it represents as true 
this is the way it represents, the, its mode of representing um, uh, the weather will be nice tomorrow, as true. So there's kind of representing as true this whole content. As true is a way of representing. And that's different from hope. When you hope that the weather will be nice tomorrow, it's more like a, uh, uh, a representing of the weather being nice tomorrow is something that would be nice if it were the case, that it would be good if it were the case. So hope represents as good its content. The weather will be nice tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so what I propose is that when we think about euphoria and we say that it represents things as wonderful, it's very natural to hear that it was meaning that it represents the content, things are wonderful. But then we would have to ask, represents how? What is the distinctive mode of representation characteristic of euphoria? And I think once we think about this, it becomes clear that what we should really say is that euphoria represents as wonderful the content, things. And I think this has two advantages. First, um, the content now becomes very very weird and indeterminate and diffuse. It just thinks. It's no longer a propositional content. It's what philosophers of language call objectual content. It just thinks in general. That's the content. And, um, and that, I think that um, speaks to the, the diffuse feel of uh, a mood very well. And at the same time, uh, putting the wonderfulness information in the attitude, uh, understanding is as part of the mode under which a, uh, a, the euphoria, a euphoric mood presents things, makes clear why a mood is not a belief. The belief that things are wonderful has a completely different representational structure. It has the attitude representing is true, and the content things are wonderful. So the content is completely different in the belief and in the mood, and the attitude is completely different in the belief and in the mood. So, uh, and likewise, you could do that with all the other moods. So uh, what uh, I think is that conceiving of uh, moods in this way allows us to solve both of the problems for the more standard representational approach to moods. So what I want to say is more generally that anxiety represents as menacing, menacing things. And um, depression represents as awful or meaningless or insert the whole Hamlet uh, soliloquy there, uh, things. And uh, irritability represents as annoying things. What is common to all moods is that they have this very weird representational content, things. And what separates one mood from another is a specific attitude it takes towards this very unusual uh, attitude. And so in summary, I can't believe I squeezed this into uh, the time I had. In summary, uh, I've argued for a number of things. First, that mood consciousness is super important. Second, that uh, moods can be fitted into a representational paradigm, but only through correct appreciation of their representational structure. In particular, the fact that they all have this structure of representing as something for which uh, poets have to be summoned in each case, um, and the content thinks. And um, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Uriah. And now we can collect